Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we are talking about two brand new records for you. We are going to be talking about the new album from band Wolf Alice. We're going to talk about their new record, Blue Weekend. And we are going to be talking about the new record from indie artist Japanese Breakfast, talking about her new album, Jubilee. Bit more of a low-key jams and tea this week. Obviously, yeah. we're, August is not with us this week. And obviously, we had a guest last week. So it was very a high energy, a lot of talking, which was awesome. Uh, one of our most well done... <laughs> One of, our, one of our episodes that has done the most well <laughs> online it's, it's doing pretty good most, got... most well performing a one of... fan base of adequate <laughs> emily and both members of sweet trip yes Thank so sweet trip. so if that episode is well done then this is going to probably be medium rare which is you know probably for I the love best. How we need it. I which love means how we morgan need and i won't eat it stop stop okay I'll, oh, I'll you, guys have, you guys no. have you re- guys have well done steaks Ugh. No, absolutely not. Under no circumstance, either medium at the most or medium rare. Correct. Thank you. Ugh. Jake, the type of motherfucker to put ketchup on his steak. <laughs> that, is, that is fucking disgusting, and I am insulted. That is that is the meanest thing you've ever said about me. <laughs> it is, and it's like blatantly wow. untrue. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just love how we needed to distinguish last week's episode by saying... It's a podcast. It had a lot of talking in it. Um, <laughs> it certainly did. And um, well, I mean, obviously, <laughs> as is our want. Um, but anyway, let's jump into our regular programming. Jake, what have you been listening to uh, in the past seven days? Uh, well, I've been dipping my toes into several things just because like, I haven't listened to a, a huge amount of entire albums just because notably uh, this week we had an Apple Music update where... Uh, we can now more easily stream the lossless version of uh, music uh, and Apple Music's terrible, awful version of it before that only encoded in like fucking 256 or whatever the fuck it was before. We can now actually hear it well. So I've been like listening to just random shit just to see how good it sounds and listening to how nice the Apple mastering is. But um, uh, two or well, one album uh, I will shout out because another album I know that's at least two other people are going to shout out on here uh, is that I went after uh, very loud, very heavy albums uh, that have like a deeper sort of uh, sludgier sound that have the new Apple mastering and the lossless high quality audio, one of which was Baroness's Purple, uh, my favorite Baroness album and Ooh, that one really benefits from this update. Oh my God. Like you just, the, the drums just like cascade all around you in the mix. And it's, it, mwah, it's so fucking good. I, I, I still do, adore that record. Do you see if, do you see if green and gold still sounds like butthole and lossless? <laughs> um, I, I haven't yet, but I, I kind of want to just because I have a. What's it fucking, called? Golden Gray. Golden Gray. Yeah. I, I have a fucking weird ever. relationship with that album where it's just like, from like a pure musical construction level i think that album is like one of their strongest it's just that it's produced like fucking duty sucks and i'm just like why did you all why did you all do this you have this this record that has all these great hooks and all these really ambitious things that you're doing and then it's just like and you just made it sound like dog shit for no fucking reason I'm pretty sure because the thing with Golden Grey is it was produced by Dave Fridman, who's like, you know, whose production can be really, really like has is known for kind of like adding a lot of distortion and brick walling to the production of his rock records. And sometimes that can come across really well. Like I think of the records he's produced for Mogwai, for instance, or Slater Kinney um, in their kind of golden run with The Woods. And I'm pretty sure I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Fridman produced Purple as well. He did. He did. That's what makes it fucking mystifying is that they yeah. just decided to do it that way. Like, and you can hear some of that, like qu- the quality and the production on purple, but it's kind of not, it's not as, uh, it's just not as like extreme as it is on golden gray. It's like, it's, it's like legible. It makes the music legible. No, it's mm. just like purple just sounds like a, a particularly sludgier 
album of theirs which fits in line with their sound it's like okay yeah it did this this makes sense mm. and you turn on that one and it's like it's not even that the production's brick walled it's just that there's a bunch of songs on that fucking album that have this, this like fucking insane amount of white noise in the mix for like and i'm just like did you put a field recording in this metal album what are you doing yeah fucking weird hate that stupid shit but anyway listen to purple that shit's the i i'd say that like normally you don't listen to the best album from a band if you want to get into it but like i I'd, I'd actually say that maybe red could be a better entry point for them just because that's a an album that's got a bit more reverence i think but also i just think it's also good but purple is definitely a, a good just all-rounder meat potatoes metal record yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, my favorite's yellow and green, so I'm, I'm weird like that. A, t- the, a Tyler pick. A great po- pick, though. I think that the, album's super underrated. But like, that's the thing. Like, I could see, um, you know, depending on your taste, I could see someone pre- having a any of their records being their favorite Baroness record. I mean, even if even if you love brick walling, I mean, you can get past that. Then I, you're I've seen then, some takes. You know, and th- that's fair. Like, like they have a very consistent catalog, which is you know which is what makes them so exciting and i'm pretty yeah. sure i read as well in the album cycle for golden gray that they were done with like their color theme thing and that if they're if the, the next kind of era of baroness is going to be like something totally new apparently so that's exciting for whenever that happens they're great musicians it's mm-hmm. yeah um next one was going to be called turquoise and cerulean so it just ran out of just it just ran out of colors Oh no. The black album. No. <laughs> no. Enough. <laughs> enough Stop of those. It. Get some help. Culture. Just enough. <laughs> Stop it. Um I listened to oh, uh at the behest of Tyler because he's been recommending this and because I listened to the IndieCast. Um, because I've been reading uh lots of Stephen Hayden's books, uh all three of Stephen Hayden's books. Uh which, by the way, I do want to shout out um, the one about the making of Kid A, which I can't remember the title. This of. isn't happening. This isn't happening. Um, your favorite band is Killing Me and uh, Twilight of the Gods. Um, Twilight of the Gods is about just like the like space of rock music throughout, you know, the 20th century and onward. And um, you have the making of Kid A and your favorite band is Killing Me, which I mentioned briefly last week. is just sort of about infamous musical rivalries, be it between the musicians themselves or the fan bases, uh, all of which great reads. Go like just Stephen Hyden is a great writer, just a really personable, really chill dude. And he just kind of he's obviously knows his shit, talks about a lot of stuff that I didn't really know about, um, especially with regards to the production of Kid A. I didn't really know how. I mean, it makes a lot of sense in hindsight, but I didn't really know how tumultuous that time period was for somebody like Tom York and just sort of like following up OK Computer and the burnout that he was suffering and just like trying to find a new sound. And it made me hear that album that I've heard fucking 70,000 times in a slightly new light. So, you know, do that. Uh, all, all of those are great. I, I think my favorite so far is your favorite band is Killing Me just because it's very personal and anecdotal and it's just... Uh, it's interesting learning about music rivalries that I've only kind of vaguely been aware of. Um, but as a result, I've decided to listen to my first Los Campesinos album. Uh, I took a listen to Hello Sadness, um, which is really funny because I did it back to back with the Menzingers album, Hello Exile, which funny and k- kind of bands with similar energy, honestly. Um, they they mm, sort of just, have just this- eat a eat a gun, just eat a eat a gun <laughs> yeah i mean that was that was uh, i was at work and i was just like that yeah, i'm gonna i'm gonna make myself feel like shit um but no i mean both of those albums uh terrific i just think it's a really solid uh all-rounder sort of exciting uh <laughs> punk album um i can't wait to listen to the rest of you, you good there so it's just tyler going <laughs> no like i'm not going to talk about it now because i'll talk about lost camp in my own section but i will mm-hmm. say one thing which is that i'm very pleased you liked that record jake oh yeah it's great they're, they're a bit of a like you know they're very much like a fr- very personality focused band and some people find them grating and you definitely i think picked one of the easier entry points and also a very underrated record like i mean they're just a fucking t- it's stupidly very underrated good. band but yeah, I, I'm, I'm super pleased that that record landed for you because I listened to it myself this week and 
I just I can't understand why pe- more people don't love Los Campesinos. Yeah, I mean, I listened to it. I mean, I said I listened to it back to back with the Menzingers, and I'm like, yeah, if you're a fan of that kind of music, I just don't see what reason you have to like not be all over it. Frankly, I mean, yeah, it's just the it's very, very, uh, it's very, it's the very, it's like the, the the intersection of Jake and Morgan Core, really. Yeah, it's like the the exceedingly British uh, version mm-hmm. of that. Like it's like incredibly, uh, yep. it's incredibly British, but like. And, and that will be a thing that will possibly be grading for some, but will once you kind of get on board with the very particular kind of like, because all the songs are basically about either football or sex. Um, and, and, but like, <laughs> not in a way where you need to be like intimately experienced with either to enjoy them. I think, <laughs> think that's the only thing. So- I think that's the only thing British people talk about. So, more songs about football and fucking by the talking heads. <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah that that's that that should have been a lost campesinos album title i guess we'll talk about this too i'm just sort of going through all of uh uh i'm sort of going back through all my list of canon favorites to properly fill out my new topster and um one album i've never really put on my list but i've just it's sort of grown on me a little bit over the year as i started like listening to it more and more and kind of edged in there at the very very end is um the black parade uh my chemical romance which um yeah. is strange because th- there was something about that record that like when i first heard it i was just like man the songs are really here on this record it's just like every single one of these it's just like iconic 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 and it's all great yep. and i didn't really vibe with how cleanly produced it was it was just kind of like it was like i, I kind of wanted a grittier dirtier edge to it because i think i was viewing it through the lens of it being a, like a punk album and now that i've listened to it more i'm just like that's really not fair because i really should look at it for what it is and that's being a, a queen style arena rock album um yeah and- yeah like it's, it says a lot that when mike and headlined reading they brought on brian may as a guest to yes. close out the set with which is like I view it through this context now and I'm able to get on board with a, a lot of how it sounds a little bit better and I, I definitely really really love that album um, maybe not as much as like some people do I think it's like damn close to being the the perfect version uh, of itself I, I don't really think I would take off a single uh, song on it but like I think the only stumbling block that album has for me, and it's an album I love a lot, so don't hop on my ass, but like, even for the type of music that it is, it's it's penchant for melodrama is occasionally a bit too overbearing. There are just sort of some moments on that album where I'm like, all right, Gerard, kind of rein it in just a little bit here, because like there are some moments where it's really, really poignant on songs like Disenchanted. And then there are songs like Cancer, where it's just kind of like, okay, cool. I feel like Leslie Manville in uh, Phantom Thread, where she's like, I won't hear it because it hurts my ears. And, uh. I, uh, like, it's it's just one of those things where it's like, it's mainly because it's propped up around like material that's just kind of better than its lesser moments. And it's just like, yeah, it knocks from beginning to end. I, I think it's great, but like just some of the writing, it's just like that in, entrenched in that sort of, 2000s pop punk emo songwriting that's just like it's just a little bit too like I I feel like there's like a little bit more growing that I feel like uh the bands could have done like I really wish that they had gone on and really like continued their stride because I feel like they could have grown as a band and like truly made something that's like pushed the genre forward if anyone was capable of it I think it was them like there's a lot of people who were like I think it was a couple of years ago. This is a fucking weird ass tangent, but like there's a couple of years ago where um, it was right after Astro World came out and people were like, is fucking sicko mode the bohemian rhapsody of our generation of music? And I'm like, no, it's welcome to the black parade. You fucking idiots. Like what, what, what get, get out of my home. But like, I don't know. What I'll say for the black parade is that I basically, I think I agree, uh, Jake. I think it's 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 a terrific record, near perfect. Uh, but I will say for the, I guess melodramatics of it, that it it, it, it kind of gets away with that for me because it's sort of in keeping with 
the general style and that the music and the kind of sort of album that it's trying to be and the sort of records that it's pulling from the kind of very sort of histrionic yeah. uh storytelling uh and and i think jared way it does a magnificent job of kind of pulling that off uh with the record which is not a very easy thing to do without just no. seeming ceaselessly cloying i probably agree with you that um my apologies to Sersha. i probably agree with you that cancer is one, one of the weaker moments on the record um but i don't think that it is at all uh not in keeping with the emotional tone and style of the rest of the record it's it's just one of those things where when you're doing something that's so uh, excessive in all of those yeah. regards it's definitely um you know going to be a challenge to pull that off consistently but the the joy of that record is that it, it, it does pull it off uh so well for the most part um uh, another album just sort of going through uh favorites of mine i listened to illinois uh, by Sophie and Stevens again. I mentioned my first listen to that being uh, that I was really, really fond of that record a, a while back, and it, it has only grown on me since, uh, as Sufian's albums tend to do with me. Uh, and I've gotten to the point where I think that that is my favorite Sufian album. Um, <sighs> I, I, I just, I, I, there's something like it, it, it sounds Real hot immaculate. take, as far as I know. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean um, it's like, uh, what's your favorite Radiohead album? Okay, computer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kid A but, um, in rainbows, fucking any of them. Yeah. But uh, with, with Illinois, I, I just, I really get caught up in the, it's one of those albums that's really, really purposefully structured. And, you know, sometimes that works for you, sometimes it doesn't. But like, that's one album where I really think the cohesiveness just hangs at home. Like, I don't know. I, I get really caught up in how that flows from one song to another. And I just love the, it feels very like I know that you know he's got albums like Michigan beforehand, but this feels like the final form of Sufian sort of like arriving and like everything he's done since has been kind of like branching out from Illinois with like yeah. but with like this or like you know like Age of Ads is like it's Illinois, but you know him focusing more on the electronic and shit and like his leanings towards those kind of inclinations or the ascensions like that, but like doubled or you know fucking <laughs> Carrie and Lowell is like this, but like dialed back a little bit and it's like it sort of feels like the the blueprint for the rest of what he would continue to do from then on, and it's just a fun album, man. Like that album just has so many songs where it's like you know it's got. John Wayne Gacy Jr., Predatory Wasp of the Palisades, stuff like that. But it's also got like, um, uh, fucking, I, he's trying to remember the song titles on that album is really fucking difficult because half of them are a paragraph long. Um, but like the the Night Zombies uh, uh, song where it's just, uh, like yeah. you got the like, back choir, it's just like, I L L I N O I S. Oh, I just, oh, it's real yeah. good. Uh, it, it fills me with joy. It's a very, very, holistic album that i've come to appreciate more and more um all right well morgan what have you been listening to this week uh so you know some some stuff uh we all kind of did a inadvertent group listen of mastodon's remission <laughs> oh uh, that's all right we did <laughs> and that Fuck, dude that there, there there's a song on that album called mother puncher <laughs> and that 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 yeah. should tell you everything you need to know it, uh, it starts off by sampling the the fucking tyrannosaurus roar from jurassic, from jurassic park. park and that is how you know <laughs> that they're just like oh we for real for real with this shit and then it's just like with the with the apple digital mastering it's just like i felt like i was being battered it was awesome yes uh yeah listen to that fucking loved that uh probably yeah it's pretty much my favorite mastodon album so far uh only heard three now uh one the well one is emperor of sand uh and the other is leviathan which i also listened to this week and which is basically just as good as remission uh i just kind of prefer remission because you know it has a song called Mother Puncher on it. And that, again, that should tell you all you need to know. It's, it's more forwardly and, aggressive. Like it's more, it's like Leviathan's less one note, but like, it's also yeah. just like a bit more like, I don't know. It's just sort of apples and oranges of what you're looking for in a metal album. 
Yeah, I think yeah. I'm, I, I mean, haven't I... heard I haven't heard Leviathan yet, but uh, but I'm looking forward to that record because I'm looking forward to seeing Mastodon apply their sound to something that's quite conceptually. Uh, yeah, dead. my only and that is my that only is most com- of their stuff, which is awesome. I love that. My, that's my only issue with Remission was that it sounds amazing, but I I couldn't really get. I don't really think that the record is has a conceptual. Maybe it does, and I haven't grasped it yet. But it was just like it's it's a record that sounds great, and the songs are fantastic, and the riffs are great. Um, um, so it's like a, a strong, a really strong eight out of ten album that I I am yeah. looking forward to seeing. Leviathan's a little bit more ambitious. So yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing them like really build on that. And basic take, but yeah. Blood and Thunder is their best song, so that too also. The other thing I will shout out is that I listened to thursday's a city by the light divided uh it's the third thursday album uh love full collapse love war all the time just a little bit less but i gave a a listen to this one it's the lowest rated of the three and i i don't like it as much as full collapse but like it it is just nipping at its heels once again our boy dave friedman on (laughs) on this thursday album and that makes a whole lot of sense uh, when you listen to it, it doesn't sound traditionally good, but I, I think it works for what it's going for, which is like just the loudest shit you've ever heard in your life. And I think that's pretty neat. It opens with what is probably my favorite uh, Thursday track, which is called The Other Side of the Crash, which I think of... I might be wrong about this, but I kind of think of it as a as a sequel to Understanding in a Car Crash. It's about similar themes and iterations, and it has a very similar energy. Uh, but I kind of prefer this one because it's honestly a bit more ambitious. But yeah, very good album that I could pretty much understand any reaction to <laughs> now that I think about it. Just because it, I like this band because I don't really know anything about them. Yeah, you would. I mean, you have to just you just have to have ears to like full collapse. Yeah, fair enough. August, give that album a nine. So Christ. okay, exactly. I didn't have a lot of time to listen to stuff this week. Um, I listened to a few new releases from transgender alternative pop star left at London. The debut record T.I.A.P.F.Y.H. I don't know what that stands for. It stands for it stands for there is a place for you here. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, and it's a really beautiful record. I would say if you liked the new Porter Robinson record, you will enjoy this. Um, I also had moment. Yeah, uh, it's I, I enjoyed it very much. It opens with a ten minute opus that laid me flat on my ass. Yeah, um, cool. Really good time. I um I have been kind of um sprawling through albums lately because we have like a, a gap in our schedule next week that I want to make sure we fill with the right record and so I've been trying to like listen to records to try and find like really interesting records and I didn't listen to this f- to full left at London album but I did listen to that 10 minute song and that song is amazing <laughs> like yeah, holy shit really. i have to be honest and say that when she first came up and her early eps came out i did listen to them and i just i just didn't really get anything from them and i wanted to like the music because she's such a funny personality and she's obviously uh, mm-hmm. her place in the trans music community is obviously super important especially with how online uh, that whole wave of music is but this if the rest of the record is as good as that first song then it's um uh it's every bit the sort of record i would have wanted her to make and i that that's that 10 minute track is is stellar <laughs> and i don't yeah. even want to describe what happens in the song because it, it goes mm-hmm. to some really unexpected places that i was not expecting this particular artist to go to and it was just like wow i was just like stunned listening to it so yeah great track um, well, the last album I listened to, not for this podcast, um, a couple of days ago, Jagged Little Pill by um, Alanis Morissette. <laughs> yeah, I know, but you weren't, uh, you weren't yeah. expecting me to be like fucking fist pumping that album. But <laughs> oh, it's great. It's, it's, it's really good. It's really good. I, I, I loathe to say that I really like that <laughs> album. It's, it is just full of 
undeniable hooks and amazing songwriting and this great sort of perspective on the lyrics. It, it is occasionally a bit too like 90s sort of conceited, too cool for school for me. Um, but if you listen to this album and like you ought to know, doesn't just leave you breathless, you haven't lived. Like, um, yeah. It's full of moments like that. Absolutely. The thing about that record is, I I was my first high school girlfriend loved that album, which probably tells you <laughs> more than you need <laughs> to know about that relationship. Um, but but so I got into Ashing the, Pumpkin's girlfriend. Yes. So I got into that record then, um, and uh, so what? And I obviously like I was a teenager. I knew you ought to know, and I knew ironic, and I was like, okay, you know, these are decent songs. But I was not expecting that record for like how stacked it is with great songs yeah. like there are other songs like there's like three or four other singles on that record that i did you will know when you hear them but you'll like either i mean if you're me anyway you'll forget you would have not had any clue that alanis morissette was responsible for them and you would not expect them to hold up as well as they do like there's just so many great tracks on that record the deep cuts are awesome on that record too sure it's not a perfect album she's no tori amos as far as i'm concerned but she still uh it's that record is still such a blueprint for so many inferior artists that came in the wake <laughs> of it uh and it's, it's just remarkable how good the songs hold up for the most part yeah and, and consistently across the record like yeah to just just no, yeah. her energy on that album her she's really funny just genuinely funny on that record too uh yeah i, I dig that shit Absolutely. Um, I, yeah, and I want to round out by just shouting out um, this emo album I got recommended this week. Um, it's called No One Loves You by Bliss. Um, I'm going to say it's not a perfect album, but um, it has some really emotional moments. Uh, for example, track two, Sail Smoke is a great song, and just the whole ambience of the record. It's really exciting. Very, uh, It's like a mood you want to sit in and cry. Um, so I listened to a shitload of music um, this week and I really want to touch on most of it. So I'll, I'll try and barrel through this as quickly as possible. First thing I want to shout out, I listened to the new record from, uh, I believe, an artist from Niger in Africa called Madhu Mokta, uh, who is uh, basically a guitar. He's this, this motherfucker is gifted. He plays the guitar in a way that I don't know that very many people since Hendrix have played the guitar. And that's not me just saying like, he's the best guitar player since Hendrix. I mean that he plays in a very virtuosic way that specifically reminds me of how Hendrix played and the tones he uses are very kind of like classic um, watery, but also like really glimmery and shiny and awesome. It's intertwined. This record is intertwined with lots of kind of classic African folk music styles. Psychedelic. It's incredibly psychedelic record. It's called A Freak Vic Team. Um, there's a bit of blues rock in it as well. It's an absolute fucking trip. It's 40 minutes long, but it flows like one whole track. King Gizzard vibes. Um, but I mean, I like this record more than I like any King Gizzard record. Not that there's re that's really an appropriate comparison anyway, but but yeah, this record is stellar. Uh, absolutely try and carve out some time just to throw this on. It's not a long album. Uh, and the the playing, the guitar playing on parts of this record anyway, there are significant sections of it where he, he plays acoustic rather than electric. But when he goes electric on this record, it is genuinely mind expanding. Uh, it's just really, really fucking fantastic album. So I also checked out um, a record that I know Jake checked out a few weeks ago, uh, that being the Mountain Goats Transcendental Youth. I'm um, just going to be real quick here because I want to get through lots of other albums, but I will say that this record is fantastic. Um, surprise, surprise. Mm -hmm. uh, yet another Mountain Goats record that I unabashedly thoroughly adore. Uh, there's not too much else to say except for the fact the that... Diaz Brothers yeah yeah <laughs> well I, one thing i want to comment on specifically about this record before i move on is the fact that uh, at this point in the mountain goats discography the band themselves are becoming much more prominent in the songs it's becoming less solely about john's writing and more about just the mountain goats as a unit which is a fantastic development because john's songs are 
are good enough themselves to stand on their own but the the way that the band are contributing in their own unique ways the way that their um drummer is is adding these very specific and 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 detailed and intricate um patterns and just so much is happening in this record that i love my favorite mountain goat song new favorite mountain goat song which feels like the thing i say every time i listen to a mountain goats record for the first time. <laughs> my new favorite mountain goat song is white cedar uh which is on this record which is just this absolutely gorgeous i love it so much because it's completely almost completely unlike any other mountain goat song that i've heard uh very gorgeous track um lots to love on this record also worth saying uh, i'm sure this is a probably a really standard mountain goats fan take but uh the opening track on this record which is a tribute to amy winehouse is definitely one of their best songs as well and one of my favorite openers on any record of theirs too um just a great album moving on uh next thing i want to talk about briefly is i will jake's already touched on and i already kind of chipped in about los campesinos but so i'll say a little bit more uh, because they're quite easily the band I spent the most time this week listening to. I got into them uh, when I was graduating high school and around the time I was getting going into my first year of uni. And that was the time to get this band into my life. They're, they're, they have one of the most underrated discographies in all of rock music. Uh, specifically, they're kind of an emo band, but like sort of emo, twee, pop, rock. There's a lot of different ways you could possibly describe their sound and it has evolved over the years but their early records um specifically capture a very kind of angsty and emotional and just like nervy and uncomfortable and awkward feeling uh and they just kind of like render it triumphant basically they play it as not this kind of dour sad thing even on their record hello sadness they they, that's almost an ironic title even though that is a record that has a lot of sad things in it because they turn all of this kind of twisted ugly emotion into some kind of like triumphant raw expression which is why i think specifically there'll be a band that appeal to Sersha and probably to morgan too even though the britishness of it will definitely be something that morgan will not be as used to i'll specifically shout out um their album their first album hold on now youngster which is now in my top 25 albums of all time um which is a long time coming i think uh, because it was a really a matter of just trying to figure out which album of theirs would be the one to finally cement its place in the canon. And I've gone a while without listening to Lost Camp, um, and but just coming back to them this week, all of their records, and I mean all of their records, all six of them are at least, I've given two of them tens and the other four nines. That's the hit rate for me. I, <laughs> they simply don't have an album below a nine for me. Uh, they, they, they absolutely do not do, do not stop um and, and they don't have like a slow sad dour record either they just like have this consistent energy on all six of their records um and it's just awesome but yeah hold on now youngster is the one i'll specifically shout out it is the core you know it is the definitive record of theirs it might not be your favorite but it is the one that most defined their sound and it has their most definitive song on it which is you me dancing which is in my opinion deserves to be in the canon of greatest songs that capture adolescent angst right up there with neighborhood number one tunnels by arcade fire and 1979 by the smashing pumpkins it has a very similar energy to both of those songs except it makes you want to dance and throw your arms up and just it makes you feel like you're going to be 17 for the rest of your life and that's Los Campesinos um what else I want to shout out this week oh I listened to obviously podcast listeners if there are any podcast listeners who regularly uh, pay attention to this segment you'll know that about two months ago I listened to and gave an instant 10 to the wonder years the greatest generation which I re-listened to this week incidentally and still remains a perfect album in my estimation um actually that actually that is I said this on Twitter as well that's probably my favorite pop punk album just ever um and so I listened this week to uh, the follow-up to that record, No Closer to Heaven, which is almost as good. I mean, there's potential with yes. subsequent listens for it to be as good, but like, holy <laughs> macaroni, that album is amazing too. It um, is. I have made it an upcoming record club. Beautiful. Yes. 
Beautiful choice. Fucking, uh, th- that album needs to have its praises sung more frankly, just because I, I don't know. I feel like it's everybody's instinct to go to um, the greatest generation, which deservedly a lot of praise for that album, but like no closer to heaven. I just fucking tumbleweeds. And that one's my favorite one do years record. And I'm just kind of, I... like, but, but it's, but it's, but it's so good. Yeah. That album, you're all right. And I believe that, if August August has the potential to like this band too, and if that happens, they could join the elite canon of bands like Everything Everything and Deftones and Portis Head, where like all five of us, you know, love them or have like a, yeah a, a real affection for them, which would be awesome to have a pop, a pop punk band be in that canon. I revisited an album I haven't heard since I was a kid that I absolutely love from a fantastic Scottish band that made only one album. Uh, which is like the band Life Without Buildings uh, and their album Any Other City, uh, which is uh, an indie rock record that is totally unique in the world of indie rock. Like it's recognizably an indie rock record, but there's no other band in the world that have made an album exactly like uh, Any Other City. It is just fantastic from start to finish. Their front woman is one of the most charismatic front women's in the history of music. Like she sings in ways that that i've never heard any other singer sing the way that she does and it could potentially put some people off this record but i for me it's the selling point she's just absolutely unique and absolutely just energetic in a way that really like makes you smile it makes me smile anyway and the songs in this record are are fantastic an amazing album but anyway that's my week So Japanese Breakfast is the musical project of one Michelle Zorner or Zornier or Zorner, I think, who has been making waves with her Japanese Breakfast records for the past five years, um, specifically in 2016 and 2017 with the one-two punch of Psychopomp and Soft Sounds from Another Planet, which are records that um, were beloved in the indie sphere and immediately had her Uh, as a person to watch for future releases but in in the music sphere michelle kind of went quiet a wee bit i mean it's been uh four years since soft sounds uh, but she hasn't stopped working she also put out her first i think memoir i would technically be the way of describing it a book about her life called crying in h mark that specifically i haven't read it yet but i'm looking forward to reading it it specifically zeroes in on how she dealt with the death of her mother, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. which is a very specific theme that hangs over this new record as well, to a certain extent, Jubilee, which um, from its title alone tells you a little bit about what to expect from this record. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll just see the floor in a second because um, I'm hoping we can have a little bit more of a back and forth on this album. Cause I think there's a lot that's interesting to talk about in terms of the songs, but what, what is interesting is that my experience with Japanese Breakfast has been that I've always appreciate I've always really dug Michelle as a songwriter, but I've always, I've kind of struggled to get into Japanese Breakfast up until this point. Like there are songs I liked on both of those last two records, particularly Soft Sounds, which had some great kind of synth poppy stuff on it that I really enjoyed. Um, but I was, I, I never fully cl- clicked with that as an album. And I found Michelle, I, I mean, I, I really love uh, Michelle as a songwriter, as I said, but there have been points listening to Japanese Breakfast where I found her voice a little bit grating, uh, which is just a personal taste yo, thing. Your yo mama grating. Fear, totally fear. Um, <laughs> I'm but, not sure that it is. I was going to say, like, we're going to rate Tyler's mother at the end of this episode as well. But, Redemption arc me please because I am happy to say that I don't have any of the issues that I've had with previous Japanese breakfast records with Jubilee at all. I think that uh, Michelle sounds great across this entire record and as the title would suggest this is the most kind of triumphant and larger than life uh, music that she's ever made and it is frankly a great fit for her. I have seen music blog and music journalism people over the years touting her as potentially one of the next big indie songwriters and while i've liked what she's done i never quite seen it i've always just preferred 
uh, a lot of the other artists that she gets compared to, such as Mitski, for instance, which is a bit of a reductive comparison, honestly. Um, but there are lots of other kind of female singer songwriters in the indie sphere who have come up in recent years who I've been like fully on board with from the get go. Um, and, and I've always kind of hated that Michelle wasn't one of them, but now I'm fully on board. Jubilee is a fantastic record and I'm very excited for us to talk about it um, and what makes it special. So um, who wants to kind of, does anyone want to kind of kick off this discussion with um, their thoughts on um, Japanese breakfast and where Michelle is at? I'll say, I don't really have much to say and that's not a like a, uh, a slight against the album or anything because I think the album's terrific. Um, I, I am a, a longer, like I, I'm a really big fan of stuff like Soft Sounds and Psychopomp. Um, pretty sure Morgan shot Soft Sounds my way like two years ago at this point. And um, yeah. yeah, and I just remember listening to songs uh, uh, by her in your car occasionally and being like, damn, this bitch got pretty voice. And so I checked out her uh, records and uh, I've been a fan. And um, this is a bit of a leap forward for her um, in like just how ornamental and kind of lavish I think the instrumentation is here. I think one big point of comparison for me with this new record specifically is uh, Julia Holter, specifically something like Have You In My Wilderness. Very, very, very similar records, I think, in terms of the uh, palettes that they draw from and just in terms of how deep uh, some of these mixes can get. Um, I also do want to shout out just sort of that opening three track run uh, that she has of the um, of Paprika, Be Sweet, and Kokomo, Indiana, uh, all of which are fantastic fucking songs. Um, Satoshi Kon. Well, I, you see, I, 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 you say that, and when I was listening to Paprika, one of the things that I couldn't get out of my head, I was just like, Michelle is the type of person who totally will have seen a Satoshi Kon movie, so I wouldn't be surprised and, because this, yeah. this does kind of remind me of Susumu Hirasawa's soundtrack for that, honestly. It's because, it's because it's very deliberately inspired. Well, all, and all of that. By gosh golly, I am a fan of Mr. Hirasawa's uh, compositions and what have you. So that that did not go unnoticed, and it was a pretty fantastic uh, way of going through. Um, and I just think that this is a basically an all killer, no filler record. It's like 36, 37 minutes long, but it doesn't feel slight. I feel like every song here has a lot of definition to it. Um, there's not a lot of lulls and energy, and when they are, I think it's pretty like notable. I think songs like um, posing in bondage um, for even though they are definitely a little bit lower on the scale in terms of the energy that they provide or songs like tactics they provide so much in terms of lyrical depth or just in terms just, of just like the sound of both of those Immaculate. songs like i bondage the particularly waves. like oh my yeah God. yeah what i yeah. what yeah. i love i love so much about posing in bondage especially because it was the second single for this record is that it reminded me of the stuff i liked the most on the last record of hers but it also is just this one shade of this very colorful and just just consistently successful album that does so many different things like there's so mm. much just variation within the first five tracks alone and i have to completely agree jay can say that i i absolutely think this is an all killer no filler album i very much struggle to pick uh, uh any kind i don't think there's a weak point on it and i'm gonna very much struggle i'm just gonna have to pluck uh a least favorite track out of a hat maybe but i i, I think that it's a remarkably tight tight and consistent and concise record and that is exactly what uh it should be as well um there are i think artists who make albums with songs that hit with the immediacy of tracks like paprika and be sweet and then their records get bogged down and other tracks yep. that just don't quite live up to that level whereas i think with this album michelle operates at that level almost constantly and she's always seeming to be thinking about what she can do to add to songs to make them more interesting or less um you know predictable or of a template like there are certain tracks on this record where there are combinations of sounds that are quite unexpected like one of my favorite tracks on this record is slide tackle which is yeah. this mm. um ballad track basically but it has a dance beat 
on top of it so it's like she the, if you isolated the vocal uh, it would just be like and, and just play it they had this kind of reverby eerie vocal with maybe some get sprightly guitar or whatever it would be this very kind of sultry ballad but she throws this dance beat onto it which completely changes the tone and the feel of the track and works it works so much better than it should do on paper there's the silky saxophone solo on this track oh, uh, so really good. really dope uh nocturnal ah. synths uh there are these wiry and sprightly guitar lines that are like sprinkled all over the track interestingly played by ryan galloway of the band crying um and oh. a nice little collaboration there uh, and, and that those details like that those kind of sprightly guitar parts and that saxophone solo the song doesn't need them but the song becomes so much more interesting and colorful as a result of their presence and they slide in beautifully no pun intended um the combination of sounds on these tracks are, is just just wonderful uh, and so refreshing um and, and and so much more interesting than if it were just a standard uh synthy sultry ballad like it may have been on earlier records um so and i think that speaks a lot to the confidence that michelle has at this point in her career as a songwriter i think she spoke in interviews about wanting to approach this record with like the mindset of making her great album like there was very much like a a real creative focus for her on this record and the time spent away from making uh japanese breakfast records uh allowed her to really hone that and so jubilee is a great title because it it feels very much like her triumphant arrival at least in my estimation into the world of great indie artists it is yeah. in yeah. very literal sense um i listened to it when i was driving this morning and i was just like god this shit's the sound of the summer i mean it's just <laughs> yeah. so like it's so like bright and and colorful and like i've also been listening periodically to a lot of beach boys recently and there's a lot of really similar timbres mm -hmm. in some of the instrumentations that they use of like that really deep really bright dream poppy <laughs> sort of sound and i and i love mm. that shit i mean i'm pretty sure I mean, that kokomo indiana indiana is yeah. a, obviously a deliberate reference to the beach boys um but even like <laughs> obviously like oh, if you're gonna kokomo. reference <laughs> exactly like why <laughs> reference kokomo but that's funny like uh, the sound of that song there's like a real sunniness to it that is not a million miles away from brian wilson composition yeah totally yeah, yeah. um th this was my first japanese breakfast record by the way um Beautiful. i think it, I, I i'm not surprised that this is you're saying like her arrival as an artist because you listen to this and it's like there is there is like a risk in making music like this or getting lost in the crowd to an extent um, but what makes this really stand out is the quality of the songwriting and the instrumentation, you know, um, that just never puts a foot wrong. Um, Tyler's comment about the variety is so on point. Like, I was here for the sax solo. I was here for the guitar solo at the end on that amazing last track. Um, oh, fuck yeah, that one's so God. good. Just two and minutes of nothing but yeah. lush fucking beautiful instrumentation mm -hmm. I, I i have like a fetish for shit like that right um and the and um i, I just i'm always here for a sax solo whatever you want to put it um and just overall like there's just a confidence an understated confidence on this record that they know exactly what needs to be done at any one moment to make the song bang you know um mm. And I just, I really respect the kind of professionalism and that control. No, absolutely. Um, and so, I mean, again, it, it's a, a, a really good, the songs are, are really good, but you know what I'm like, what I, what really elevates records for me is when there's a richness to the album itself beyond simply how it sounds. And so what I think is so triumphant about this album is that, and why it really does feel like a jubilee is that, it is this, it is, it features some of Michelle's most emotionally rich songwriting and a general, th some general thematic ideas that I think are really interesting and, and really boost the songs. Um, so yes, we do open with Paprika, which is this absolutely joyful track. It is, it re it's, it's a song in her words about reveling in music. And it's like a joyful celebration of where she is as an artist, the joy that she's able to find in performing 
and uh, for both herself and for her audience and it uh, and then be sweet is just like the confidence of being able to just write a really straightforward pop track and make it be the pop song of the year in my opinion like i think this is the best pop song of 2021 um it is fantastic and and even though it is this kind of triumphant arrival for her she's able to weave in some more emotionally complex and even darker moments into the record without um taking away from that um like kokomo indiana for instance like it is sunny it is string laden it is beach boys-esque as has been said but it's also this kind of quite sweet song about uh young love and longing um that she manages to make um sound kind of more wistful than sad uh the character at the center of the song is a teenage boy learning to accept being without his partner and in many ways this theme of steely acceptance of a new state of things so, so as to not be bogged down by the past is a nice encapsulation of where michelle seems to be at the a lot of the songs in this record are about clinging to loved ones or learning to move on from the from the loss of loved ones that obviously parallels what michelle has experienced in losing her mother um, but is explored in these in, in very different and moving ways like you have tracks on this record that are more kind of irreverent like savage good boy which is the song about that takes the perspective of a billionaire with a nuclear bunker who is basically trying to beg women to join him in his bunker so that they can repopulate the earth after the after the love, apocalypse love under the silver lake <laughs> yeah basically like <laughs> it's this very pathetic song but or the, the character in the song is very pathetic but it's it's a, a really nice piece of concise storytelling as well because the song is so short and um and it really but also again you get this theme of like longing of, of this desperate need to have something that you don't have uh and then the most i think poignant example of this in the whole record is the track in hell which is uh a song that michelle wrote about having to put down her dog uh and and she describes the day uh, very vividly in this song it's, it's almost difficult to listen to and she harmonizes with herself in the track which i think is a beautiful kind of way of like you know her showing herself sympathy making herself feel less alone in this very isolating and painful time um and then the band just kind of blasts through it um and it has this vibe of like if we slow down then we'll fall apart so we just have to keep pushing through and it's a beautiful way that the instrumental uh complements the sort of emotions that michelle's singing about I think Sersha said uh, a, a great sort of um, thesis for, I think, a lot of the lyrical and thematic content in the album, which is understated confidence. I think that Tyler, like, even when, uh, you know, you talked about, like, the songs that uh, directly address things like longing and, like, learning to deal with something is that they're always approached from, like, a level where you have uh, a distance from them. There's sort of that, like, yearning, but also just sort of like a you've like progressed past it and that sort of adds to that sense of jubilee where it's like there is emotional darkness here but it's always like measured and it's always taken in like with a sort of like I you know I dealt with that but you know and I am dealing with that but it's always in a way that makes you feel like it's you're bouncing back from it and it adds to the sort of resplendent nature of the album and it like it's just everything feels so in sync on this and I, I feel like that really adds to how like brisk of a listen it feels it's like it's so dense with ornamentation and uh, instrumentation that like if it was any longer I just sort of feel like it would maybe detract from that a little bit this is a record I could see being a really good source of comfort as well yeah because not only does it have those kind of jubilant moments but the songs that are about longing and the songs that are about needing someone are i don't know they're some of the most beautiful and lush and they just feel like a warm hug like posing yeah. in bondage for instance is a song that's specifically about um wanting to be with feeling a sense of like control when you're with your partner that makes you feel like comfortable like you're not gonna lose it 
uh, and it's a very beautiful song and the sentiment in the song is really nice um, and and the song itself just has this warmth to it the way that the synth sounds so like dark and nocturnal but like also warm and like an embrace um, I, I absolutely totally. love that about it and the song tactics which I think is the most has probably the prettiest arrangement of the whole record has these really ornate and, and gorgeous strings and it's a song about being apart from that source of joy in your life whether it's a partner or whether it's a pet because it follows um in hell i think so it's kind of an extension of that theme of that song but it's basically about having distance from um the thing that tethers you the thing that gives you that control that's talked about in posing in bondage and it's almost as though the 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 arrangement of the song tactics the strings the gorgeous lushness of it is like it's comforting you it's like it feels like I'm getting a warm hug from that person. It's like laying down and dreaming of them. Uh, and there's, a, I mean, I know I'm getting very, you know, eh, with my descriptions here, but I think when that that's kind of what Michelle is going for with with the way that she arranges these songs. It's not just that she's making a pretty, beautiful, lush, awesome record because she wants to, you know, people to heap praise on her as an artist, but it's because she has a genuine. Uh, creative vision for her music that I am I really appreciate and um, I don't know this record is just super listenable it's very very uh, relaxing but also like you can get up and dance to it as well and um, it's just one of my favorite albums of the year Um, Morgan Morgan I'm curious to hear what you think of this record not that I'm Mm. Well, not, that, not that it's a I big mystery. I think Japanese breakfast fan here, I would wager, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, I am a simp, so I must do some more simping right here. This is exactly what I wanted her to follow up soft sounds with. Like, like in the way that I, like, I wanted it to surprise me, and I wanted it to, like, th- what I would say is these the previous Japanese breakfast song that most of this album reminds me of uh, is on soft sounds and it's machinist and my favorite song this, on that record <laughs> yeah up to this point and probably still that was and probably is my favorite Japanese breakfast song um, and like every song on here sounds like variations on that sound i guess and it it's like but there's there, but that's the thing is that there's so much more to it than that and like i just i i am in, intoxicated with this um our friend april uh tweeted the other day on her private account that this was the best pop album since emotion and i you know i gotta i got there's a lot to sift through there i can't ne- i i can't necessarily agree or disagree uh, beyond the general sentiment of it's f- really fucking good. Michelle Zoner knows and appreciates the application of saxophone in pop music, which is another thing that Machinist had that is subsequently all over this album. And I just, I, I, God, yes. And I, I really resonated with what you said about this kind of being like a comfort album a little bit because it's just like so many soundscapes that I love and really like the shit that I throw on when I don't want to have to think about what I want to listen to sounds like this like when I don't want to challenge myself when I just want to be wrapped in a blanket of fantastic soundscapes everything that I would put on sounds like this in some way and as such it's it's currently in my top three of the year and it, you know, will be. It'll be interesting to see what else comes along to rival it. One thing I guess I'll I'll end this out on is by commenting on my favorite song on this record, which is the closing track. Um, not for lack of um, yeah. challengers, but Great what I like, what I like about it, you know, above and beyond the fact that it above above and beyond just. <laughs> what I like <laughs> about it is that uh, it is a moment where, and I've talked a lot about how I. I think this is this is Michelle's kind of arrival as a great songwriter as well as a great musician. 
Um, but and so the songs across this record are consistently great. And I've talked about why I like the depth of the lyricism and all of that. But this is this beautiful moment on the record where Michelle she takes a I, I love the point of influence that she cited here because it's specifically Tyler Core. Um, she's said that this song was specifically inspired by the Wilco song. Uh, at least that's what you said, which is the opening track on their album, A Ghost Is Born, which is my favorite Wilco album. Uh, and that is a song where Jeff Tweedy tries and fails to use words to express complicated feelings about a romantic situation. And so instead of even trying, he eventually stops singing and just plays this fucking enormous guitar solo that just rips through the song. And it's like fucking incredible. Uh, and, and that was a direct inspiration for this track. And the most complimentary thing I can say about this song is that it is every bit as good as the Wilco song that inspired it. And the fact that it is this, I mean, above and beyond that reference point, it is just a great way to close this record. It has this real sense of emotional catharsis to it. Uh, Michelle sings um and her she sings and she's unable to fully convey the feeling that she's experiencing and so then she just fucking rips into a solo and it, it's just one of those things where this record is such a source of comfort such a source of triumph and all of these things and then there's this moment at the end where it just sinks into being pure catharsis which is a beautiful way of ending and, and and it's larger than life and it has this really cinematic uh feel to it the cinematic quality to it that really cements the records you know heights uh and i i mean i haven't heard a better guitar solo than this in a record that's come out this year and i mean i'd be hard pressed to think of the last the most recent occurrence of a of a solo that is as fucking awesome as this is but i mean yeah it's just a dope as shit way of ending the album completely unexpected as well like i was not expecting this to i mean i saw that the record had a six minute closer so i was like okay 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 but i was not expecting it to hit like to be what it is and and it, that is i guess a nice encapsulation of what are the most beautiful thing about this record is that michelle is able to confound her expectations by but also just do the most dope shit possible in the process it is both like completely surprising and as Morgan said, exactly what you want this album to be. Okay. Well, uh, favorite tracks and ratings then Jake. Uh, my three favorite tracks are be sweet Kokomo, Indiana and posing for cars. Uh, least favorite is uh, savage. Good boy. Uh, and I give the album an 8.5 with room to grow. Uh, my three favorites are Posing in Bondage, Paprika, and uh, Sit, which is another song that I just really find enveloping in mm -hmm. the the uh, the sounds that it creates. And it just, you know, I hate to just say I like it because it sounds good, but I, I do. Uh, so here we are. Um, least favorite... Uh, if I get, since he's not here, Chinese satellite, uh, ten. Beautiful. Oh, Woo! Wow, lovely. Um, so my favorite tracks are "Paprika," "Be Sweet," and uh, "Potion for Cars." Do I have a least favorite track? They're all pretty good. Like, why pick and choose? You know. Um, but it's getting uh, a seven and a half from me. Okay, my three favorite tracks are Posing for Cars, Be Sweet, and Slide Tackle. That's really tough. And I was originally going to give this an 8.5, but I'm going to bump this to a 9 because I can tell that's going to happen anyway. Um, it is a really, really fantastic album. One of my favorites of the year. Just, and just, just had a Daniel Plain view there very quickly. Just, I drink your milkshake. The milkshake in this case being Tyler's 9 hot wolf alice are sort of a uh, uk based indie rock band sort of came onto the scene with their debut album my love is cool some eps additionally uh, around the same time uh, garnered them some pretty significant acclaim 
they also uh, their follow up album Visions of a Life, I believe, was nominated and did it win the Mercury Prize? It did. It did win the Mercury Prize. Uh, it won the Mercury Prize, um, and now this is their awaited third release, following that up afterwards. Um, I think it's generally sort of considered that even though that second album uh, won the Mercury Prize, is that nobody really looks at it uh, more fondly than they do the first album. Um, I, I still like that album. I know a lot of people don't, but uh, but I am a, an enormous fan of My Love is Cool, um, and I believe Morgan is too. That was an initial bonding experience album for us the, that I remember have quite many fond memories of. So I was looking forward to this particular release, especially when they put out the first single, uh, which is The Last Man on Earth, because it definitely had a more polished sound than the previous two records, which um, sort of dabble in sort of the rougher side of indie rock. They could occasionally venture into things that sounded like shoegaze, uh, sort of just lower, like not really lower five, but just like very fuzzy and like crunchy sort of sounding guitars and like sort of a punk energy that they had um, to their sound. And this was a bit more bright and shimmery and uh, just a bit more of a, a, a bit of a step up even from Visions of a Life. Um, and, uh, you know, they sort of did the, the rollout of the singles, um, which I didn't really pay attention to after I heard the first one, because I was like, all right, I'm sold, I'm in, let's go. And now we are here with Blue Weekend. And uh, is there anyone who wants to lead off with their thoughts here? Um, well, I have a couple more bit of bits of contextual stuff to add, ooh, I guess. Go ahead. So, so yeah, yeah, you're right. So this Wolf Alice are kind of... An, a UK London based uh, indie band that are very much a kind of like indie hype band that have come up in a certain scene. Other bands that I think of when I think of that scene are like London Grammar, for instance. There's this wave of um, reverby, dreamy, female fronted British pop bands in this very specific vein. And Wolf Alice honestly never really stood out in the pack to me from the other ones. But it has to be said that regardless of my thoughts, they, this is definitely a band that have gone from strength to strength in terms of popularity from album to album. They created a lot of buzz with My Love Is Cool. A lot of people were really on board instantly with that record. Uh, expectations were high for Visions of a Life, and that record is really well received as well. For whatever it's worth, I prefer that record to the debut. Um, I'll just be the person who does prefer that record i guess but that's fine i, I uh, like that album a lot too tyler even though i prefer the first one it's just yeah. but i mean the, either way they're both in this kind of place for me where it's like there are some great songs on here but this doesn't really stand up as a as a record for me anyway um i mean but i the the songs on uh, particularly that last record were great though like my two favorite wolf alice songs still are the title track on that record and specifically the song don't delete the kisses which is awesome amazing Great. amazing yes. song um but um blue weekend is somehow i think their biggest triumph yet it is also the first record of theirs to debut at number one on the uk albums chart which they have been chasing i believe both of their last two records debuted at two so they were this close um and they finally pulled it off with uh, blue weekend which also in so many respects sounds like the <laughs> fullest good job all right there thank you for providing backup vocals for me there. <laughs> um, oh. but also in addition to this record having been their first to debut at number one on the uk albums chart it was also a triumph for them in in so many other respects as well i mean it remains to be seen how well this album will do in the long run uh, whether it will, because I, I believe they got a Grammy nom for their last record as well, or maybe it was yep. the first. But anyway, this is currently this album's currently sitting at a ninety six out of one hundred on Metacritic. Uh, it Whoa. is it is being rapturously received by critics, and it's easy to see why. Um, I can see equally why some people might not be particularly enamored with this record if you're not into the specific sound. But I mean, it's as strong an execution of it as they've um, pulled off yet. I think. Uh, it, it sounds like they have a lot of they had a, a high budget making this record as well it sounds rich and dynamic and huge at points and just clear and crisp and and really resonant in a way that their other records sometimes reached but not quite as consistently as this one does 
Uh, it's also for me the best paced of their records yet the most concise and punchy uh and everything about it i think is uh ultimately well i don't think it's a great album in the same way that the last record we just reviewed is i do think it is uh, a record that i have been wanting i was hoping that their previous records would be for me which is an album that connects and creates an atmosphere that i instantly find absolutely enveloping yeah i mean uh i was an og will fallis fan i remember how much i how delighted i was when someone for the first time showed me you're a germ off their first album um and then when uh silk was featured in the train spotting 2 trailer um i i felt like it like a deep sense of being seen at that point um and i think the reason they were so successful is like at the time that first album came out like indie rock and indie pop rock was such a big thing in the UK and they came out with songs that combined a lot of very disparate elements in a way that was really exciting um, in terms of sort of like dream pop and alternative rock and indie rock. So uh, you can see that in songs like Bros and Silk and You're a Germ. Um, and I remember how disappointing I found that second record, how just even now I remember, I remember fucking zero about that album. And so I was, I was tentatively excited for this record, but I think they, uh, well, I don't think it's like the best record ever. I think this is their most consistent set of tracks. I also think it's interesting that when I saw Will Fallis live at a music festival, they, they very consciously and obviously consciously chose to play all of their loudest songs for the festival crowd, all of their biggest, hittiest, loudest songs. And the loudest song on this record is about how everyone wants them to make loud songs to be hits, which is like, I think it's a real highlight, but I love that ironic sense. And the whole album for me is filled with a much more self-conscious uh, coolness in a way. Like they're bringing to this album in a way they haven't before. I think almost like what uh, the Arctic Monkeys brought for their first couple of records, you know, in terms of that bravado and knowing you're owning it and yeah, um, I don't want to. I don't want to hog the mic, but I find this a very exciting record. Yeah, the band I uh, while you were away, the band I compared them to in terms of like fellow scene bands and a very specific sound in the UK that they came up alongside is London Grammar, and I yeah. I used to be a basic bitch who liked London Grammar more than Wolf Ellis, but the weird thing has been that. Uh, as these two careers have occurred in tandem, I've my enjoyment of London Grammar has dropped off, and my enjoyment of Wolf Alice has steadily increased. Um, <laughs> I, I think they've just become uh, not to necessarily rely too much on a band comparison, and I'm going to move past this now. But they have become a much more interesting band, even within their niche, which is obviously a very kind of specific sound. But there is a lot of um, nice variation to what you would expect from this band and this record. I'll get into some of the songs now that I love. Um, the best song on this record is maybe the most kind of like standard, but it just hits in a way that I... I it makes it feel like quintessentially great wolf alice which is the track lipstick on the glass it's this very smoky nocturnal indie rock track that uh it uh, it feels very much like this band hitting the mark uh in exactly the way that i hoped them to on their previous records even though there are songs that i love on those records too but i mean the sonic density and the variation on this record is to be commended as well smile for instance is one of the heavier songs the band have released i love the crunching intensity to it it has this blossoming chorus too that i absolutely love one thing i want to shout out about this record is that I, when i first threw it on the day it came out i was kind of driving i was on a night drive uh, and, it, and it was kind of like just after the sun had set and I just threw it on, not really knowing what to expect. And it ended up being one of those things where it was just kind of the perfect setting for that. Uh, it was the perfect accompaniment for that particular thing. It's just very kind of smoky, nocturnal, but pretty album that's perfectly suited to kind of like driving around, seeing city lights and and all of that, that whole scene basically. And, and um it, it's never really like i've listened to it a few times this week and it's never really sounded as good as it did then but it still sounds really great um one of my another one of my favorite tracks on this record is how can i make it okay which uh is, is just fantastic and 
is a good point at which I think to celebrate. Uh, yeah, Ellie Rousel's stellar vocals and range, even within her particular kind of dreamy falsetto, are fantastic. I think it would be easy to lump her in with, and and I mean, on previous records of theirs, I've been tempted to do, to do this, to lump her in with a lot of other singers in this very kind of dreamy style. Um, but I, she really does push her voice on this record in ways that, um, are really re- rewarding, I think. Um, yeah, she... Something else I think makes this track really work, in my opinion, is that she, as a songwriter, um, shows like an awareness of when, even though your writing might not be so complex, you have hit on a very effective emotive line, even though that's most simple. And I think that's a renewed awareness on this record. And on that song specifically, it allows the instrumentation and the melody to really shine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of the indie pop rock stuff that we're reviewing this week, the songwriting here is not as dense or intricate or interesting as, as the songwriting in the Japanese Breakfast album, but it's almost as though, I mean, th- th- this is music that for me serves a different purpose. This is music that I think is, I, I enjoy mostly for how easy it is to just relax into and fall into and, and uh, like just have it wash over you, which is not a reductive compliment because that is a difficult thing to do without just being anodyne and dull. And um, the strength of this record is that it does not rely on um, a single mode too consistently. Like I already talked about Smile as well, but then there is another one of my favorite tracks on here, which is Play the Greatest Hits, which is like a punk there's a genuine punk energy on this track that I was not expecting. It adds a weight to the band and it makes them feel more than just, you know, dream pop band adds distortion and plays fast. It genuinely feels like they are executing that particular musical idea very confidently. Uh, and another one of my favorite tracks on this album is the absolutely enormous feeling myself, which builds gradually to this really blaring climax that i absolutely love this in particular was a moment on that first listen of this album where i was driving down the motorway and the city lights were kind of blurring around me and it was raining and this track was playing and it was just this perfect accompaniment for that Um, there are moments on this record i don't care for as much although honestly there's not that many of them i have to say that i'm not a huge fan of the song delicious things uh it sounds very nice and the i think the the band are are pretty sharp on it but some of the lyricism on this track feels a little bit too cute and ditzy the other track that kind of just washes over me is the song no hard feelings but i can't even really call that a bad track it's just one of the weaker moments here and it certainly doesn't disrupt the flow or the atmosphere of this record it's bookended really nicely by the two tracks titled the beach um yeah i mean i don't have much more to say on this record than that but i found it genuinely delightful to listen to in a way that I wasn't expecting. To counter uh, somewhat uh, the both of you, um, first of all, I just think it's funny that like in terms of bands that we have covered or just bands that we all listen to, I think Wolf Alice may in fact be the most inconsistent band in terms of what (laughs) we enjoy about them and what parts of their career we enjoy about them. It's, it's, it's bizarre, honestly, how we like not a single two of us can manage to agree on like everything about them, which is like, that just doesn't happen for any other act. And I think that's funny, um, which is, it, it, it's why I, I just kind of think this album's a mess. And it's weird because like, I'm probably the biggest fan of them pound for pound of anybody on the podcast, considering I really love their previous two records, but like, ah man i don't know there's some like it's it lies in the fact that it's like yeah it's the this music maybe doesn't suit the same purpose but like it's because some of it is so front and center but like some of the lyrics here just like the songwriting just really takes me out of the experience it's like some of it's just like borderline insipid to the point where it's like okay i don't really there's nothing interesting happening here musically so it's not really gripping me um that's not to say that the album is devoid of anything good i i love how they sort of wear this particular sound um it's a little bit more forwardly 
um, aggressive. It's uh, really relying on that sort of like synthy, sort of like poppier side of their sound. And they, they wear it well, is that even in the moments of this album that I enjoy the least is that most of the time I'm still enjoying what's happening sonically, even if I can't get into what might be happening uh, lyrically or structurally. Um, I think that songs like, yeah, Delicious Things, is not my favorite song on here. It, it's it's fine. Um, I'm not really that big into uh, Smile or Safe from Heartbreak. Um, Smile just honestly kind of annoys me, to be perfectly honest. And Safe from Heartbreak, I just find to be kind of anodyne, really. It's just kind of repetitive and nothing happens in that song musically where I'm taken with any of it. And it's just kind of structurally, it's it's exactly the like the set of lyrics that you are imagining when you see the song. It's just like, oh, safe from heartbreak. And it's just like, oh, it's, you know, not putting yourself out there so you can avoid it. it it's exactly what you expect. And um, I, I also sort of have that feeling on no hard feelings, which again, it's just the song where like my pulse just doesn't pick up for whatever reason. I, I think it has definite highlights. I think that I totally co-sign what Tyler says in terms of Lipstick on the Glass being a great song. I think Play the Greatest Hits is sort of a, it, it's got sort of weird moments where it has that sort of like male vocalization of just like the Play the Greatest Hits. Of, like, just like, that's a little, that's a little off-putting to me, but like the song is like really forward and aggressive enough to be fun. It's kind of like Yuck Fu on the last album. Um, so I'm, I'm into that definitely uh, and I also think uh, the beach is, is a pretty decent opener and I still am going to say that the last man on earth is the best song on the album I just really like how dynamic that song is it's really structurally ambitious and the song just goes in a lot of really great places and I find it lyrically compelling in the way that some of the songs here that are just kind of like oh I'm famous I'm in LA now yeah. and, and it's just yeah. kind of like this doesn't really like, not to say that they were always this really poetic and dense band, especially on that first album, but it's just like, it's always about things that are like really youthful and identifiable and relatable and you get it. Whereas here, it's just kind of like, okay, all right. Yeah. And it's, it, it's just kind of like pretty, but it just sort of, this album just sort of goes in one ear and out the other. Like, it's just, for me, it's just like, insanely inconsistent like one song is good one song is fine one song is good one like it's it's just so uneven for me which is weird because it's like apparently i'm going against the grain with my opinion on this one which doesn't make any sense to me i fucking weird ass band nothing about this makes sense in terms of our responses to it i guess um, so I, I will say without backtracking from the fact that i do like the majority of this record that you have kind of nailed something that that i do no, that I am not as hot on about certain parts of it. And it is basically all encapsulated by the song Delicious Things, which is, yeah. I think, a certain uh, attitude that um, the singer tries to go for where it, where uh, she, the, the singer, I know her name, Ellie Rousel, yeah. goes for where it's like they're definitely trying to communicate an important step that they've taken, obviously, in becoming yeah. a bigger band. But it's very, um, and I hate to use this term, but like the song Delicious Things and the writing and it is very kind of like, uh, it's not right to say manic pixie dream girlish, but it's very mm. like, it's very like, you know, ugh, like, like, uh, ooh, the vibes are off here. And, and that's, she, that's one of the lyrical moments that really took me out of it. And I was just. And that's like, not even the, really? sort of, the, the worst part of it is the moment of the song, which is like, where the, the music kind of drops out and she starts whispering and she's like, there's a guy here. I think he's a bad man. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, there's some of the vocal deliveries too that are just borderline. Like they're, they're just like her delivery is like, like she's like she's doing it with like the energy of like a rap yeah. verse. And it's just kind of like that yeah. doesn't really. I, I actually appreciate, I appreciate when she has like interesting cadences like that. But there are moments yeah. where it does feel like there, that, that song, like in Delicious Things, for instance, it's a song about like, oh, I'm at a party and everyone's doing drugs. And it's like weird, right? And that. <laughs> And it's just like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, yeah. I enjoy this the less I pay attention to what you're saying, which is maybe a mean thing to say. Um, but I don't think it's weird. like some albums are just like that. And I can totally see why this is just react the way you do. It's just that even on songs that I think sound super pretty, like I think a really emblematic song of the record is uh, the closer for me, uh, the beach Two, where it's just like, I love everything that's happening sonically. And I think it's beautiful. And then I look at it lyrically and I'm just like, what the fuck is she talking about? 
just like, I don't know what this song's about. And every time I try to think about it, I just get confused. I'm just like, all right, okay, cool. I like it. It's fine. But I have a feeling well, I'm about to get steamrolled by Morgan. Okay. I mean, am I that much of an asshole? No, I, I mean, just have Jesus. a feeling you're gonna you're gonna have much stronger feelings, and you're just going to be like because you and Tyler very often when I'm not hot on a song that you all like, you're just like I did just blasphemy, and I'm just like, well, I mean, sure. It's not like I don't do that. One, I want it noted that I do that to literally every single person. I know. On this I'm just sensitive and bitchy. Um, well, the point is, I'm not going to do any of that uh, because I was fully prepared for all of this. Uh, for uh tyler to be positive but you know reserved for Sersha to be positive for august to be well to black him out of my mind no matter what he was going to say or whether or not he was going to be here so um uh and jake to be some variation of positive but also with more reservations so i can i can just come right out and say that i fucking love this thing i am f firmly in the the Metacritic 90%. I mean, that's ridiculous. I think Metacritic for music criticism is like just wildly, like it's it's useless. It's functionally useless because I don't think there's yeah. any way to get a gauge on how like people feel about an album from that. Like with, well, no, with I, sites I, like I, I, Rate I, Your Music, with sites like, I'm not attacking your decision to bring that up. I think it's it's important to lend a certain context of critical reception to an album like this, where it's sort of an indie act that is starting, that not starting, but that has broken through and sort of being able to contextualize that with what music critics are thinking. But I think a much more uh, accurate metric is to look at sites like Rate Your Music or Sputnik and see that, you know, this has like a, three point yeah this has a 3.57 on radio music right now and the last time i checked it had a 3.8 on sputnik which i think is like perfectly accurate for how most of the reception outside of like the, this band's ravenous fan base section whatever section of that fan base you know <clears throat> you know however they feel about it because any band of this size is always going to have that section of the fan base yeah. that feels the way that they do um but yeah uh is, is a few counterpoints that i'd raise is just i think wolf alice is a lot like the 1975 in the sense that if i pay attention to the lyrics i'm going to go insane <laughs> um i i just so thoroughly do not give a shit what delicious things is about uh and but there's a reason for this and the reason is that I think Ellie Rousseau has, has always, as a vocalist, been really enchanting, like easily my favorite thing about this band. Uh, but she's never exactly used it as an instrument in the way that certain like fantastic vocalists do. Um, I was reading an interview, she said specifically the, that during this album cycle, she was really inspired by Kate Bush in the way that she just uses her voice as like a sort of its own unique instrument within the song. Um, and I definitely see that shine through here. Um, that's, that's why like, I don't really, I, I mean, yeah, the lyrics on delicious things are kind of insipid and dumb and boring. And I also don't care because I find the atmosphere so enchanting. And, you know, that's, that's not like, I don't want it to sound like I'm I'm making excuses for the writing on this record uh, because it's not like something's lacking to me, but I don't care that it's lacking. It's just that the thing that is lacking has been replaced by the fact that Rosel sounds the best that she ever has on this record. And I, I am just in love with the way her voice sounds on like from from pretty much every song on here, she's finding more dynamic and more interesting ways to be sort of, you know, to sort of present herself across the songs. Um, and, oh, excuse me. And while it's always been interesting on the previous records, 
and sometimes really damned impressive, like on Don't Delete the Kisses. Um, I think it's at its most consistently impressive here. Um, songs like How Can I Make It Okay and The Goddamn Last Man on Earth, especially like the, the latter portions of that song where her vocals are just sailing over the album. I just I love that shit. And are the mediocre lyrics a drawback? Yeah, I can't pretend that they're not much as I would like to. I feel like the journey of my emotional response to this album lies so exclusively to the sound of the music itself and the way Rosal sort of uses her voice as an instrument within the songs themselves that like the lyrics almost just kind of, you know, I, I get the intended emotional response without really listening to the lyrics, uh, which, and I mean, may sound like a backhanded compliment of some kind or let, like it's a negative, but actually it's good because it's bad or whatever the fuck, which I hate. And if it comes across that way, I don't intend it to. My favorite song on here is actually The Beach 2, which, yeah, I don't know what that song's about either. I don't know what most slow dive songs are about. And I don't really fucking care. I think that's kind of what dream pop in general is about to me. Not specifically like, you know, not looking into the lyrics because you don't need to, but, you know, being able to tell the story of, uh, of the emotions that the artist is interested in through sound and delivery, like, by itself almost I, I think the best example of this is the title track on heaven or las vegas uh because <laughs> you at I'll some points you literally because you literally cannot fucking tell what liz frazier is actually saying sometimes for what it's worth morgan i honestly think that you and i are basically on the same page it's just that i <laughs> i don't think i would have anything to say about this record if i didn't talk about the lyrics which anything i mean substantive other than it sounds great um, and I also think that if the lyrics were less legible, I probably would like this album more. <laughs> I, yeah. that, Tyler, that, I, I really wanted to bring that up here because it's just like, because when Morgan brought up that point, I was just like, damn, he's really got, he's definitely onto something here. So why does it not make sense that I, the person who of this podcast is probably the most well-known for fucking liking dream pop and shoegaze, why does that not hit for me? And I think that that Morgan is like onto something specifically with like the way you use lyrics as like, and I don't say this to inherently be negative, but like to be like wallpaper is there is an art to that. Is that there is an art into making lyrics even on like a just purely um, like an audio level and just like how maybe even just certain syllables hit you and just getting the emotional tenor from the song just by the music and how the lyrics just sort of uh, coalesce and aid to that. And I think the reason that it doesn't work for me here is that the songwriting feels too pronounced. Like, again, it's, this is a interpretation thing. This isn't like a thing I'm going to disagree on is that it's just for me anyway. And the way I've looked at their previous albums is that the songwriting is a bit more front and center, especially in like in the mix and especially with some of uh, uh, how they deliver uh, or mix Razel's voice in how like sometimes I can totally get what you're seeing and like that's probably the songs that I like more on this album or where that succeeds better at it's just that like I, I, I feel as if maybe they have not mastered the art of being an Elizabeth Frazier or being a slow dive where they're able to use the lyrics in that very specific way maybe yet and just sort of it depends on where you land on that gradient but I do think that's a really good point to bring up just because of how this works in this particular genre, because that's clearly something that's like throughout, like, you know, you bring up slow dive, you bring up Cocteau twins. It's just like, that's definitely the case with a lot of those. It's like, I probably couldn't tell you half of what the songs on um, slow dive self-titled are about, even though I've heard that album 60,000 times in the last five months and how I think that's one of my favorite albums ever. And it's just like, it doesn't matter what the songs are about. It's what they're about to me. What, what I think, important. I think a good way of describing this and maybe wrapping it up is that it's like sweet candy, right? This type yeah. of music. It's like, you know, that the ingredients aren't necessarily good for you or substantive yeah. or anything. 
Um, and sometimes it's too rich or sometimes it's too sour or sometimes it's the, the, the flavor is too strong in some way. Yeah. Some and people so, are just going to find it more than others. That's just and how it works. And it's not to say that, that, you know, that means you don't like candy. It just means to say that yeah. some, some candies you're going to like more than others because of how pronounced certain aspects are. And I think that's a good way of describing the appeal of dream pop bands like this. Is Sweet that, Trip is another example of a band that's exactly like this in that respect. Mm. And I think it, on that note, it's a pretty reasonable to, place to end by saying that yeah. despite the fact that some of the tangy aspects of the lyricism on this record don't fully land with me, Wolf Alice's Blue Weekend is still very much a delicious thing. All right, favorite Word. tracks and ratings. Yeah. Um, I'll, we'll do reverse if, since we tend to alternate. Yeah. Um, my three favorite tracks are Lipstick on the Glass, um, feeling myself and how can I make it okay? Um, my least favorite track is Delicious Things, and the album gets a seven point five from me. So my favorite tracks are probably um, yeah, Lips of the Glass, uh, let's say Smile, and let's say uh, Last One on Earth. It's going to get an eight from me. Uh, my three favorites are. Uh, the beach to how can I make it okay and lipstick on the glass um, if I if I had to pick a least favorite it'd probably be delicious things but you know it just you know if I can whatever and I'm going to give this a hearty nine and a half wow it's a good weekend for Morgan yes yeah uh, <laughs> my three favorite tracks are lipstick on the glass the last man on earth and um i'll say play the greatest hits and least favorite uh my least favorite smile uh, and i give the album a six out of ten okay well on that note let us know what you think of these records that we've discussed today japanese breakfast jubilee and wolf alice's blue weekends do you think we got it wrong do you think we got it right uh let us know if we missed anything uh in the comments below and make sure you check out our other videos we post at this rate we've been posting like three videos a week um so we're always coming out with new reviews our next um videos are going to be we've got two record club episodes coming up very shortly on modest mouse the lonesome crowded west and three days graces one x two very different albums and i suspect the tone of those videos will be very different <laughs> but they'll both be good so check those out and as always rock over london rock on chicago apple think different.